try to be on time. The previous two colleagues doubled the time they were allotted. Um, so the, amount, the, the title of the whole conference was turning, leaving no stone unturned. And I think I call ours turning all stones. When it comes to NPLs, then the main point is you don't know what you find under the stone. Maybe you have a diamond, so it's, it's a good borrower. Most likely, it's likely just worms. They are there and they will remain worms. So essentially, when we look at our international experience in NPL resolution, we kind of have saying that they're kind of like perpetual lingering diseases. You will never really be rid of them, right? So they're always there in the system. Um, our colleagues at the IMF, or I think the ESM talked about the doom loop. So maybe I mentioned a little bit about what the doom loop is itself. The economy slows down, we saw it in Cyprus. The bank's balance sheets are weakened by NPLs. The weak banks need government support to prop up the capital. Fiscal position of the government weakens. The government's borrowing costs increase. Austerity kicks in. The economy slows down again. So countries get again and again get trapped in a self-reinforcing cycle of NPLs, weakened banks, rising sovereign risk, and deteriorating real economy. The fact of the matter is, and we've heard a lot today how things have really improved, but a decade after the global financial crisis, these banking sector weaknesses continue to weigh down on economic performances. You know, and I think our first colleague mentioned that NPLs in Cyprus went down from 48% to 43% in four years. 43% is not a good number. So I think I had to do my job to kind of remind everybody, 43% is not a number that you need for a well-performing economy itself. Um, if you look at the stickiness behind NPLs itself, what makes them stick? They're there 43%. I mean, the challenges related to asset quality are seriously undermined in the earlier stages. Things are, maybe people think, they're not that bad as they seem. Time will fix everything. That's not really the case. Um, banks are reluctant to acknowledge the true amount of losses, especially weaker banks, because they don't just don't have the capital space to do it. Banks lack the expertise and resources for effectively looking at areas. There is a focus on shift from sales-driven model. There needs to be a shift from a sales-driven model to a recovery claims model. People that bring in claims need to be valued actually better than people that make the sales. The shortcomings, as we all know in legal proceedings, they are lengthy. And then there are pressures on, on forfeit for forbearance on the central banks itself. So all of this, we're saying, promotes gaming theory. There's strategic defaults, people that can actually pay the truth to default. Again, it makes the problem worse. Um, looking at what we see has actually worked, it really does require a fully coordinated and centralized response led by the public sector. A central orchestration is necessary. It's not just the Ministry of Finance's job, it's not just the central bank's job, it's just not the SISEC's job or the private sector job. It's everyone's job together to actually work to fix the problem and recognize the problem and take the haircuts if, if need be. Um, there is a NPO resolution requires involvement of um, the objective, sorry, this is just mentioned that. There's objective for a public policy response itself. Usually the public sector policy has a clear clear goal, minimum, minimize the cost to taxpayers and ensure financial stability. At the same time, it needs to kind of be done in a way that makes sure the more viable, the most viable assets are remained viable and the ones that need to be closed down are actually closed down. If you look in the region itself, um, there is important recognition that, N that NPL, the banks are recognizing the NPLs at the moment. There is strengthening of supervisory and regulatory framework there. There's AQRs done, there's balance sheet repairs done, there's ECB guidance on NPLs itself, and there is acceleration of insolvency work as we've seen in Cyprus in the last couple of years. All of these are, are very, very positive. But the agenda is definitely unfinished. Um, there is a lack of scale in the in NPE sale market itself. Since 2018, uh, to EU new accounting standards have come into play. The council today approved the new position, the positioning requirement on the capital requirements for, um, for NPLs itself, and now they are going to negotiation. But four EU Eurozone countries do have excessive NPLs. Greece and Cyprus for households and companies, Portugal for large enterprises, and Italy with having 30% of the total Eurozone NPL stock itself. 
So these are large numbers, and we can't, I would not shy away from just recognizing them. We spoke a little bit earlier about tech itself, and NPL resolution does need to be accompanied with a better data transparency and cross-country comparison itself. So in a sense, since the financial sector is linked and closely linked, we know who owns Greek banks, we all know who owns the banks in Italy, we know who owns the bank everywhere else. Similarly, the NPL space also needs to be linked everywhere. There is, there is, no, there is no magic potion, as we all, all realize. Um, in some countries, they have reduced to pre-crisis levels, and that is good because pre-crisis level, lest we forget, were around 10%, 5%. So again, 40% is not a pre-crisis level. There is cumbersome and efficient collateral enforcement mechanisms. There's underdeveloped frameworks for going concerns. There's lack of national personal insolvency frameworks. There's myriad of tax problems. There's undeveloped market for stress. All of these things kind of have to be done together. Okay, so to be on time, um, so the agenda, it's just a few lessons that we've learned. You know, number one, um, the urgency of addressing the challenges are always underestimated. They're underestimated at the start of the crisis, they're underestimated after the crisis itself. Uh, two, they call for a holistic and comprehensive approach. We look at four pillars. One, the regulatory and supervisory framework, which everyone spoke about. Ensuring operational readiness at the level of banks to respond early to rising bank delinquencies. That's where the private sector that's represented here comes into play. Strengthening the enabling environment, that's where the government comes into play. And diversifying the range of disposal options. That's again, is an opportunity for the private sector to come into play. All of these are mutually reinforced. Piecemeal does not work. Lesson three, an effective NPL resolution often requires extensive restructuring of corporate borrowers. There is generally a reluctance to make a distinction between unviable and potentially viable borrowers, and that distinction needs to be done. Frequent rounds of financial restructuring for the private sector we see do not yield any results. True operational restructuring, that is this gesture, redundancy is closed, and aiming the root cause of the borrower's distress are the things that we see work in the longer term. And there are always challenges around SOEs. I'm not saying that's the case in Cyprus, but we always see that warrant a special case itself. So thank you very much.